Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us here and thank you for the challenges we're receiving. We're asking, Lord, as we come to the study tonight, we pray. Your spirit will take your word and apply it to every heart in Jesus' name. And we pray that this word will enrich every soul. As you are calling us yourself, we pray that, Lord, none of us will reject or refuse the call in Jesus' name. You have done everything you can do. Jesus died on the cross for everyone. And we pray, Lord, there will be that response of faith in the heart of everyone. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see now. We're coming to the Bible study tonight. And we're looking at the second part of chapter 8 of Daniel. But I want to start from Daniel chapter 7 verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. That was the very first vision or the very first dream that Daniel was going to have. But now he had the second one in chapter 8. Look at chapter 8 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. That means that so far now, Daniel had had two visions recorded in chapter 7 and 8. These two visions had a profound effect on him. After the first vision, we read in the last verse of chapter 7, the effect or the impact it had on Daniel. He said, Hitherto is the end of the matter. That is talking about the record of the first vision. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations, my meditations, my thoughts much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. When he saw the first vision and he thought about the meaning that really bothered him because he understood the impact of it upon the children of Israel and upon the world at large. The understanding of the details of the reign of the coming kingdoms and the empires overwhelmed his spirit to such a degree that his vigor, his temperance, his, his appearance became weak and pale, yet he treasured the secrets of the Lord in his heart. The impact of that second vision, that is the one we read about in chapter 8, was even more distressing. Look at the last verse in chapter 8, that is verse 27. Chapter 8, verse 27, I, Daniel, fainted. And was six certain days afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Because of the understanding that he had, and he saw the future calamity, and the future problem, and the future uh, persecution that will come upon the children of Israel, they were so fearful in character. The oppressive tyrant that will arise, rule the world in the latter time, in the latter days, came vividly before him. Because of that, he became sick. Because he considered the period that will come upon the children of Israel when that vision will be fulfilled. The, the, the point is this now. If the vision could make such a, an impact upon the prophet and make him sick, what impression or impact will the accomplishment of that vision really do for those who will be living through those days? The Lord already tells us. He tells us in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. When all these things that in their soul, that is so in vision, when everything will come into real reality, then the impact on the people will be very, very terrible. Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. 
That is when the interpretation, the when the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel, of the vision, the dream of Daniel will come to reality. This is what will be happening at that time. It will be the time of the great tribulation actually when the culmination, the climax, the very heights, the peak of DC will be fulfilled. In verse 26 we are told men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 8. And then you are going to find out what made Daniel to feel the way he felt and what made him to think the way he thought. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8 and we're looking at verse we're looking at verse 27. And I Daniel fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision. He understood it. Because of that, he was surprised. He was amazed. He was astonished at the vision. Why didn't the other people feel astonished, amazed, and surprised like he did? Because in the latter part, the last part of verse 27, but none understood it. But none understood it. And as we come to the Bible study, and we look at all these dreams and visions, and the prophecies of the things that are coming on, if you do not have any understanding of what we are reading, if there is no cogitation, no thought, no meditation, and you are not considering what we are reading, it will not have any impact on you. You will come, and then you will go back the same, as if nothing is going to happen. But if you will apply your heart, like Daniel applied his heart, and he actually thought about it, he sought for the interpretation, and then he got the interpretation understood. That understanding of the vision, that meditation on the vision, and that illumination that comes upon you, that revelation that comes upon you as you understand, it will bring such an understanding, and it will bring such an impact and effect upon your spirit, that even for days and weeks of meditating, what it will happen now, what if the rapture will happen at any time, and then all these things that we read, all these things that we see, everything will come to fulfillment. It brings a great, great Let's look at Daniel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 10. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. The people who understand is going to lead us to really seek the face of the Lord. If you are not born again and then you look at all these things that are going to happen, it makes you to see. It makes you to meditate. It makes you to fall on your knees and say, Oh Lord, I need salvation. Oh Lord, I need regeneration. I need restoration. If you are backsliding, you will be telling the Lord because of the things that are going to happen. And because of the great, great pain. And because of the great difficulty that is going to come upon the people of the world. Then you say, Lord, I just need to be born again. And if you are backsliding, you say, Lord, I just need to be restored. It is that understanding that brings that kind of impact and conviction and you want to call upon the faith upon the name of the Lord so that you will be saved and if you are born again already the understanding of such a vision like this the understanding of revelation like this will make you to seek the Lord so you can be sanctified and purified and made holy it's the people that understand they are the people that seek the face of the Lord and then a great work of grace is done in their hearts Look at that, Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Because the wicked people, they don't apply their hearts to the word of God. Backsliders, many of them don't apply their hearts to the word of God. And the sinners, those who are kind of adamant in their sin, and those who are deep in their sin, and those who are rigid in their sin, those who are committed, addicted to their sin, they don't want to understand. They may hear the word read, they may hear the word interpreted, they may hear the word applied, but because they do not want to understand, they remain in their wickedness, remain in their sin. But it says, but the wise shall understand. 
is a wise people that actually become of understanding us. And that understanding of the wise actually will lead them to have the sorrow of heart. If there's anything amiss in their hearts, anything amiss, anything going wrong in their lives, it will lead them to sorrow of heart, conviction for their sin. They say, I know this is coming. And I know the fulfillment is going to be terrible upon the people of the world. And that leads them to repentance, to, that leads them to conviction, that leads them to conversion, that leads them to real salvation in the Lord. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow, when you have real understanding and you know that this is going to happen and you see the picture all painted before you and you know that at the latter days at the end of the days this is what will happen to the people of the world you say oh lord this leads me on my knees and i just want to seek your face and have real real salvation for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world walk at death. Let's come back to you. That's uh, Luke chapter 21. Once again, Luke chapter 21. When you really have understanding of what is going to happen at the end of time, in the latter days. And you know what is going to happen as these uh, prophecies and these dreams and these visions of Daniel, as they're being fulfilled. And you know that it's going to be a time of perplexity, a time of pain, a time of terrible persecution for the people of the world. A time that people of the world will seek death and they will not be able to see death. A time when real, real suffering and sorrow will come upon everybody. Not only in Israel, but in the whole world, all the nations of the world. When the Antichrist will rule this world with real terror and that great tyrant will come upon the people and such great suffering will come. When you have understanding of that, it's going to make you to prepare yourself and prepare your heart and prepare to seek the face of the Lord. We're looking at Daniel, at this Luke chapter 21. I read verse 25 again, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon their distress of nations. Not just the distress of one nation, but distress of nations. That means that the calamities that will happen at that time, the pressures that will come at that time, the pain that will come at that time, the difficulties that will come at that time, it will not just be for one nation, but for nations, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaking. What then shall we do? What's the attitude of the person who really understands and who knows that heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God shall not pass away? What will be the attitude of the people, the action of the people, the supplication of the people, the prayers of the people? What will be the heart stirrings of the people that know that these things are going to happen? We're told in verse 24 here is what Jesus said as a result of what is coming. As a result of what will be fulfilled, as a result of the great calamities that will come upon the people of the world in the latter days. Here is what Jesus Christ said you ought to do, I ought to do, we ought to do, so that we'll be prepared and the days will not come upon us and our in verse 34 and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you on our ways. It says that the people that do not understand, the people that do not have any understanding of these prophecies, of these dreams, of these visions, and they're just careless. And the cares of the world will come upon them. And then the day will come upon them suddenly without any preparation. But the Lord is saying, as you study, and as you understand, and as you know that the time is very much at hand, it says here is what you ought to do, that you need to take it to yourselves, to your life, to your Christian experiences, that the salvation you have, you hold it fast. The holiness experience you have, you hold it fast, knowing that you are to follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
what you eat in the time of carelessness, in a time of temptation, in a time of trial, in a time of persecution, and you forget all these visions and dreams and all the revelations and prophecies that were studying, and then you become careless and you throw away that Christian experience of salvation, of victory over sin, of holiness, of righteousness, and then the Lord meets you and you're not prepared. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is says, Take it therefore unto yourselves. There are some people that say they believe in eternal security. That it doesn't matter once you are saved, you are forever saved. And even though they read about these prophecies and about these uh, dreams and visions, oh, they say, I'm saved. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. If it doesn't matter, why did Jesus tell his own disciples, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. In verse 35, for a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. You know, there are people that say that the great tribulation will only be limited to Israel, will only be limited to the nation of Israel. But here Jesus Christ said it will come upon the whole earth, upon the whole earth. The vision that we're reading about and all the dreams we're studying about, all these things we're seeing, Daniel, it's not a localized matter. It is something that is going to encompass and it's going to overwhelm the whole earth. That's why it says in verse 36, watch it therefore and pray all always watch it therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man it is meditation upon the word it is kind of thinking upon the word of God that gets you prepared that gets me prepared that gets everybody in the church prepared all the children of God prepared for the coming of the Lord so that at that time when all these things were reading about shall come Come upon the whole earth, you will not be here in Jesus' name. The vision had no impact on others who heard it because they did not understand, they did not understand it. If Daniel's contemporaries in Babylon had understood that a mighty king of fierce countenance would rise and that he would be a tyrant more wicked than any king who ever lived on earth, if they had understood that he would oppress Israel more than any persecutor ever did, if the children of Israel, if the people of God, the Jews in Babylon at that time when Daniel was relating all this dream and vision and prophecy and revelation, if they had understood that the Antichrist will come and then the tyrant will come it will violently oppose uh, true worship and cause their daily sacrifice to cease and profane the temple. If they had understood that he will continue for a definite period of time and that he would only be cut off by a divine stroke of sudden supernatural judgment, then they would have been able to prepare themselves. But in the case of those people, they didn't understand. And they didn't prepare themselves. That's why the children of Israel have continued suffering, even until this time. I pray that we will understand. I said we would understand. And the way it affected Daniel, it will affect us as well, in Jesus' name. And I'll come to divide the Bible, the study tonight, to three parts. Number one, the divine perception through an angel. The divine perception through an angel. Uh, you need to understand uh, uh, the word of God. If you don't understand, how are you going to apply it to your heart? If you don't understand, are you going to take it to heart? And are you going to allow it to have such an impact and such an effect and such a kind of pressure upon you that you'll say, I'm going to jettison, reject, and repent of, and take away and cast out whatever will hinder me uh, from following the Lord until the very end. It is the understanding, the perception that helps us to be able to say, I'll get myself prepared. That's why we have number one divine perception through an angel. Number two, the destructive power of Antiochus. Antiochus. And the name is not there, but history is fulfilled, has fulfilled that prophecy already. Or already we have studied what there are three A's. And those three A's impacted the nation of Israel and also the rest of the world. The first A is Alexander the Great. And the second A is Antiochus. And the third A will be the Antichrist. Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, and then the Antichrist. And in the case of uh, Alexander the Great already we have studied that, that he was the king and the emperor of Greece at the time of uh, after the Medo-Persian Empire 
And it came with fury. It came with anger. It came with real great power and persecution upon the people of God. And then he died. His kingdom was divided to four parts. And then one person rose up out of those four parts called Antiochus Epiphanes. And he did great, great evil upon the land at that time. But then they thought it's still going to come. That is the Antichrist. And when that Antichrist comes, it's going to have real great persecution power. It's going to cause real great pain upon the people of the world. Point number three, the deceptive policy of the Antichrist. The deceptive policy of the Antichrist. I come to number one. Number one, the divine perception through an angel. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. In Daniel chapter 8 verse 15 it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. You see something here that is very much commendable and something that is exemplary. Commendable number one, number two, exemplary. It's something that we ought to praise the Lord for in the life of Daniel. But it is not just to praise the Lord for the life of Daniel. It is something that is to serve as a model, as an example for you and for me. He said in this verse 15, I search for the meaning. I search for the meaning. And that's what should happen when you read the Bible. You take time and you seek for the meaning. You're searching, you're finding what does this mean? How can I understand this? What does this imply in my life? How do I apply this to my life? What the fulfillment of this and when it comes to be fulfilled what will be the implication in my life in my family in the church and in the world at large and you find that this was the attitude of daniel he sought for the meaning we're looking at daniel chapter 7 daniel chapter 7 i'm looking at verse 15 and verse 16 daniel 7 verses 15 and 16 i daniel was great in my spirit in the midst of my body and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. I asked him. I asked him. He was always searching. He wasn't satisfied only to see the vision. He must know the meaning. He wasn't satisfied only to have revelation from God. He must know the meaning. He wasn't satisfied just as I know, I know, I know. He must know exactly exactly what the implication is, what the interpretation is, and therefore he said in verse 16, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. That's the attitude you ought to have. Let's look at chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 21. In chapter 9, verse 21, it says, Yea, whilst I was yet speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, that's an angel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and informed me and talked with me, and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now called for to give this skill and uh, understanding. I am come to give you skill and understanding. He didn't want to just have a suggestion, an idea, an impression in his mind, in his heart, and just say, I feel this is the meaning. I feel this is the interpretation. Not what he felt, not what he thought. He wanted to know the interpretation, exact interpretation and meaning from the Lord himself. That's why I was praying, and that's why God, in answer and response to the prayer that he prayed, that's why he sent that angel to him that will give him the exact interpretation and the exact meaning of what he had seen. In verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Understand the matter and consider the vision. If you are a man like Daniel, a woman like Daniel, if you are a person that says, yes, I want to understand, I want you to know, and then you get on your knees, and after the Bible study, you just don't finish the Bible study and then rush out, you want to understand, oh Lord, let it be deep in my heart, in my soul. I want a real understanding of this. You know, in those olden days, when we first started the Bible study, that's what we did. We came to the Bible study, and we learned at the Bible study, and after the Bible study, we 
spend time, quality time in prayer. Praying in, soaking in, sinking in the word of God that we have learned. And then asking the Lord, oh Lord, how does this apply to me? What can I do with this? What's the meaning of this? What's the application implication of this in my heart, in my life? How does this affect my relationship, my interaction, my friendship? How does this apply my proposals and my purpose in life? How does this apply to my working place? How does this apply to my interaction with people? That's why in those early days, the word of God had such a great impact in our lives. And I pray that those good old days, will come back again in Jesus name. We didn't just study. We didn't just come to the Bible study. We made sure that we knelt in prayer. We prayed very much that this word will be applied in our heart. And that's the reason why we had such a deep deep Christian life at that time and I pray that those days will come back again. In chapter 10 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10 I'm reading from verse 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. And behold, and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees, and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling, in verse 12. And he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou did search thine heart to understand. You see that? He set his heart to understand. He made up his mind, I'm going to understand this. And he purposed it in his heart, I'm going to understand this. It wasn't just a cursory reader of the word. It wasn't just somebody that, you know, just, just to flip through the pages of scripture. He went deep into the scriptures and he wanted to know the meaning. And he searched his heart to understand. That's the attitude the Lord wants you to have. That's the attitude the Lord wants us to have. That will set your mind and set your heart to understanding the word of God. You'll not be in a hurry. You stay in that word and you stay on that word and then you seek on that or you pray on that word and you're asking the Lord, oh Lord, I want to understand this. It is the understanding of the word that brings transformation. It that brings regeneration. It's the understanding of the what? It's not just the reading of the word. It's not just the reading so many chapters of the Bible. It is when you dig deep into it and then you say, I'm setting my heart to understand this. I must have an understanding of the word. It is that understanding that will make a very great impact and effect upon your heart and upon your life. We're told in that verse 12, it says, from the very first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand. The implication is that it wasn't just one day. From the first day to the second day to the third day. In fact, it took him about 23, 21 days, that is three weeks, just searching. Just, search, just digging. Just looking at the word. Because until he had a proper understanding, he would not stop. And that should be your attitude and my attitude. That is what is going to produce results. That people will know you have been at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, studying the word, digesting the word, taking in the word, understanding the word, and applying the word to your life and to your heart. From that very first day, you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself uh, before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. In verse 14, now... I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. You'll see then the angel came and said, I want you to understand. That's what I'm saying, for you to understand. I pray that the Spirit of God will come upon every one of us. And give us real, real understanding in his watch in Jesus' name. When Daniel saw the vision, he did not understand, neither could he discern its meaning. Though God had given Daniel knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, even as far back as chapter 1 verse 17, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, but in this particular case, he did not understand the vision. So he sought for the meaning. He prayed to God that 
he might have the revelation and the illumination and the interpretation of the mystery made known unto him. God sent an angel called Gabriel to reveal the true meaning of the vision to him. I just told you something now I said in chapter 1 of Daniel. Daniel had been given the gift of the understanding of visions and dreams. And yet, this particular one came, he didn't understand. And he asked the Lord. That's the same thing you are going to find among the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 11. Yes, we have some basic understanding. And the disciples of Jesus Christ had some basic understanding. But even then, whenever something was said, something was preached, and something was spoken that they didn't understand, they did not just take everything for granted. Okay, we have understanding. We are the children of God, and we understand the mysteries of the kingdom. They will seek for the meaning before the Lord. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It is given unto you. A special class of people, peculiar people, cleansed people, saved people, regenerated people, children of God. The Spirit of God bearing witness in your heart, you are the children of God. This is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them it is not given. But then look at verse 36. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tears of the field. You know what they were doing? They were asking for the meaning. We don't understand that. You said, it's been given unto us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. But this is one of the mysteries we don't understand yet. And then they asked for the meaning. In fact, Jesus also tells us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading to you from verse 15. He says, he's saying, it's not only Daniel that ought to understand, that you too, you need to understand. You must understand. Because it is the understanding of that word, especially the revelation, the vision, the prophecy that we're reading about in Daniel. It is the understanding of that that will lead you to be able to actually stand, stand for the truth. And know that whatever persecution or temptation may come your way, it is better to endure whatever it is now than to wait for that time of great abomination and great tribulation coming upon the world. For that thing to come upon you, it will be a terrible thing at that time. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading verse 15. It says, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. That's Jesus Christ telling us, telling his disciples. He said, You will see. When that time comes, and you must understand, if you don't have an understanding, what will you do that day when that thing comes? I pray God will give us understanding. I say God will give us understanding. The angel Gabriel was to explain the infallible truth and meaning of the vision to Daniel. When the angel came near, Daniel lost his strength and he fell upon his face. When he fell upon his face, he wasn't worshipping the angel. He was so much afraid and his physical strength failed him at the appearance of the angel. He was strengthened by the touch of that angel. Then the angel made him to know the meaning and the certainty of the vision. We'll come back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I go over that verse 15 again and we're reading all through to verse 22. Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. And sought for the meaning. He said, then behold there stood before me. As the appearance of a man. And I had a man's voice between the banks of Eli. Which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Make this man to understand the vision. You see, there are some people that they don't read everything in the word of God. They just read and then they begin to bring their, their suggestions in their mind. 
and their ideologies in their own mind. They are self-made ideologies. And they say, I think this will be in the interpretation. Daniel was not like that. And a true church, the true church will not be like that. And a true teacher of the word of God will not be like that. You'll get the interpretation from the spirit of God, from the mind of God, and from Christ, the living word himself. Here we're told, in, a, a man said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near in verse 17, where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Understand, son of man, there's a time of the end. The angel said, there's going to be a time of the end. You know, there are some people that think the world will continue forever. Some people think, we're here, we're here. And they live a save. Every day will all be coming. But the angel said, there's going to be a time of the end. And it says, these prophecies were in about. It will be at the time of the end when everything in detail will be fulfilled. In verse 18, now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. There will be a time of indignation, a time of wrath, a time of tribulation. And the angel said, Daniel, I'm going to make you understand what is going to be at the time of that indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. At the time appointed, there's a time in the timetable of God that's appointed for the end to come. And then in verse, in verse 20, it says, The round which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And in verse 21, And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up in the for it, four kingdoms shall stand. Up out of the nation, but not in his power. Now we've seen in the case of Daniel that an angel came to make the interpretation. Give him that interpretation. The question now is, do angels still come to reveal the meaning of the prophetic revelation to us today? Well, ours is a better dispensation. And it is the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit himself, who is greater than all angels, higher than all angels, who guides us into all truth, showing us things to come. Look at John chapter 14 verse 26. Today it's not just an angel that comes to us. It's not Gabriel that comes to us. It's not any other personality that comes to us. It's somebody greater than angel greater than Gabriel, and greater than any of those personalities that revealed anything to Daniel, the Holy Ghost himself comes to reveal the things to come unto us today. In John chapter 14 verse 26, John 14 verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, he shall teach you all things. When you read the scriptures today, when you see the revelation today, and you say, I don't understand this. How can I understand this? It's the Holy Ghost that now teaches us all things. And then he says, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. John chapter 16 verse 13. John chapter 16 verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. The truth about prophecy. And the truth about the meaning of what Daniel saw. And the truth about the coming, the, the coming tyrant, the coming antichrist. The truth, the Lord shows us everything up by his spirit. And he says, for he shall speak of, he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you what? Things to come, things to come. What Daniel was speaking about, those are things to come. And it's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit that shows us today those things to come. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us by 
his spirit. You see that? It's the spirit of God today that gives us the revelation, that gives us the illumination, that gives us the interpretation of the word. We don't depend upon angels anymore, but we depend upon the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And it says, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep, deep things of God. It's the Holy Ghost now that keeps searching. And it searches those deep things, those great things, those prophetic things, those things revealed in Daniel and in Revelation and in many other parts of the Bible that the ordinary man with the natural mind cannot understand. It is the Spirit of God that searches all things today and reveals them to us in verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man? Save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. You know, sometimes when you read the Bible, you say, this part is difficult for me. I cannot understand this part. But you understand, the Holy Ghost does not have any difficulty. He understands every part of the word of God. And if you will depend upon the spirit of truth and the spirit of Christ, and the spirit of God is going to make everything very clear very plain unto you. Even the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. In verse 12, for we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also will speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. In the case of Daniel, an angel, the angel Gabriel taught him and showed him and revealed to him the interpretation of the word. But now it says, for those of us who are New Testament believers, it is the Holy Ghost himself that teaches us comparing spiritual things to spiritual. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Still emphasizing the fact that it's the Holy Ghost that reveals to us today the mysteries of the kingdom, the mysteries of prophecy. Prophetic writings in the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. Whereby, when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It's a mystery that many people do not understand. And Paul, the apostle, said, as you read, you will understand my knowledge, my understanding, my illumination of the mystery of Christ. In verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, by who? I said, by who? By the Spirit. It's a Spirit that now makes everything very clear, makes everything plain, so that now we can understand. My question to you is, what if you're a Christian? And you do not care about having the indwelling of the Holy Ghost within. Just say, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. That's all you say. I'm born again, I'm born again. But you don't have the indwelling, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are many, many things you'll never understand. And because you don't understand, because you don't give the place to the Holy Ghost in your life, and the understanding is not that there'll be so much confusion in your life. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you're born again. Yes, your sins are forgiven, but you live in confusion because you do not have the indwelling, the infilling, the baptism, the immersion of the Holy Ghost. That's why it's important for you to get saved and then get sanctified and then be filled with the Holy Ghost so that all these things that you know come upon people and the confusion comes upon them. Confusion of the scriptures, confusion in their way of life. There's no light, there's no illumination, there's no revelation upon them because they do not have the baptism, the indwelling, the saturation of the Holy Ghost. I pray you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost because it is that baptism in the Holy Ghost that gives us that illumination of the Spirit of God. And then it comes up because it's the resident teacher, the resident teacher that teaches us the truth of the Word of God. What do you do? So you can have that in feeling, that in dwelling, that saturation, that baptism of the Holy Ghost. Number one, you must be born again. 
Number two, you must be sanctified. And after that, you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. Especially now, there, there are some preachers who are not even baptized in the Holy Ghost. And all when they come to the scriptures, all they use is their natural saints. Their natural sense, as they just interpret maybe Shakespeare, they've read Shakespeare and they can interpret Shakespeare, and as they read all the other secular writings, and because of their natural knowledge, they can interpret. And they come to the Bible, they come with the same natural mind, natural understanding, because they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they just interpret the scriptures the way they will interpret all the plays and all the writings of William Shakespeare. We don't do that. You are saved, you are sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then the Holy Ghost becomes the resident teacher, granting you light in the scriptures. We're looking at John chapter 14, verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. The world cannot receive or must repay. Turn away from sin. Be born again before we can receive that Holy Ghost baptism and illumination. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Becomes the resident teacher living, abiding in you. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading verses 3, 7, and 8. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You are saved, then you move ahead. You are sanctified, you are purified. The inner man is purged and cleansed and purified. In verse 7, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He calls us to sanctification. And to holiness. And then after that, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 5, verse 32. Acts chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 32. We need to have the Holy Ghost so that when you read the scriptures, it will shed light on the scripture. When you read the scriptures, it will give you illumination and light and interpretation. And then you'll be able to make that personal application to your life because the resident teacher, the Holy Spirit, is living within you and is a spirit of truth. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And ye are, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, whom God God hath given to them that obey him. So also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. And of course, after you are saved, and then you are sanctified, and you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are very careful the way you live. You are very prayerful the way you live. And you do not grieve that Holy Spirit so that every time you need understanding, every time you need direction, every time you need guidance, because He's there as the resident guide, the resident comforter, and the resident supporter, and the resident sustainer, and the resident teacher is there. You don't want to grieve Him so that He'll keep on illuminating your heart, enlightening your heart, and teaching, guiding you into all truth. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. The people who really want understanding of the word and illumination in the word and teaching in the word and guidance in the word. And they know that now angels are not in the business of showing us the interpretation. It's the Spirit of God that gives us the interpretation today. You want to have a good relationship with that Holy Spirit. And you want Him to remain there, resident in your heart. So He can keep on leading you into the divine truth of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grip not the Holy Spirit. You want Him to keep on teaching you, grip not the Holy Spirit. You want Him to keep on guiding you, grip not the Holy Spirit. You want Him to keep on enlightening you, shedding light on everything that you read and giving you the interpretation. Like the angel gave Daniel the interpretation, grip not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of 
of redemption. Let, uh, let all bitterness, that's what will give the Holy Spirit. Your heart is filled with bitterness and anger and wrath. And then there's no place for the Holy Spirit now to be able to move freely and to guide you freely. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. The Holy Spirit moves in the era, in the dominion, in the area, and in the place of kindness and love and gentleness. Then the Holy Spirit will be able to move. You show that you are born again. You show that you are, uh, that you are sanctified. And that you are allowing that transcendent Holy Spirit to move freely within you. And be ye kind unto another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I pray God will give you understanding. I say God will give you understanding. We come now to Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verses 23 and 24. Daniel chapter 8. We come to the second point. The destructive power of Antiochus. The destructive power of Antiochus. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8 verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And that's talking about somebody that will come after the Middle Persian Empire, after the Grecian Empire, that the kingdom of Alexander the Great will be divided into four. We've studied that already the previous week. And then there will be one little horn that will rise. And that little horn is what we're talking about here now that is uh, referred to as the king of fierce countenance understanding dark sentences it shall stand up in verse 24 and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power he'll be mighty but it will not be by his own power it will not be by the power of the almighty god he will be engineered stirred up and filled with the spirit of satan it will be the spirit of satan it will be the spirit of the Antichrist that will actually feel him and it shall be great. It shall be mighty. He will do great and mighty things in the negative way, bringing great oppression, persecution, difficulty, suffering upon the people of God because of that evil power that will be upon him. But 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy terribly it shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people it's talking about the children of Israel you will have such great great oppression power tyranny upon the people of Israel let's look at chapter 7 verse 8 Daniel chapter 7 verse 8 I consider the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the rules. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things, blasphemous things. They're still talking about that. And Teochus that came in the midst of the people, and then terrible things will he say, and terrible things will he do. Verse 23 of chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. And thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse, different from all the kingdoms, and shall devour, shall destroy, shall devastate the whole earth. Once again, do you see that? And some people think that the Antichrist, when he comes eventually, and the Antiochus is like a forerunner of the Antichrist, just like John the Baptist was a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Antiochus was a forerunner of the Antichrist. And some people say, oh, don't worry about about it. You are in Africa. Don't worry about it. You are in America. Don't worry about it. You are uh, here in Asia. That when the Antichrist comes, he will only operate in the land of Israel, in the pleasant land, in the glorious land. All the rest of the people in the world, there's nothing for them to fear. It will not affect them. But look at that verse again in verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. It's the whole earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, 
and it shall devour, it shall destroy, it shall devastate the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So then you understand the power of that evil one that is yet to come. It will not just be upon Israel alone, it will be upon the whole earth. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it shall speak great words against the Most High. Can you think about that? Somebody that will be ruling. And then it will not just be that he has private unbelief, unbelief in his heart, unbelief in his own locality, but in the whole world, he raises up his voice against the Almighty God. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall seem to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, one year and times, two years, two and, that's two now, and the dividing of time, that's three and a half years when that Antichrist eventually will come and then he'll do great, great, mighty things that will be very destructive upon the people. I pray you'll not be in the world at that time. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11 from verse 36. When that Antiochus, when he eventually came, that's what he did. But I told you already, it's just a forerunner of the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes, he'll do great, mighty, terrible things, oppressing the people, destroying the people. And I pray that at that time, you'll not be here. Let's look at Daniel chapter, two, chapter, chapter 11 verse 36. And the king shall do according to his, his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak blasphemous and marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. It says this one has been determined and eventually it shall be done. Look at verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard at any God, for he shall magnify himself above all that is above all that is called God. He'll be so blasphemous, he'll not regard anyone that is called God, he'll not regard any supernatural sin, any spiritual sin. He regards himself as the all in all. By the way, if you are like that today, that means that you have the spirit of that Antichrist. You regard yourself as the all in all. You are, and nobody else. And you don't regard neither the word of God, nor even the authority of the Almighty God. All you think about is yourself. It's like you're on top, and nothing can bring you down. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. Because when the Antichrist comes, that's what he will manifest. He will do according to his own will, and will not respond to any teaching, any instruction, any exhortation, any challenge. Because he'll say, I am all in all. I am, and nobody else. He'll try to compete with the Almighty God. And that's why the judgment will come upon him. I pray that today, anyone like that, you will repent. And when you repent, you come to the Lord and bow before the Lord so that the Lord will have mercy upon you. And then that kind of pride that makes you to compete with the Almighty God, the Lord will break that pride and then you're able to humble yourself in the sight of the Almighty God and the Lord will have mercy upon you. I said the Lord will have mercy. Then in verse 38, but in his sense shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. Shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. It says when the Antichrist comes, he will not know the God of love or the God of kindness or the God of mercy or the God of, of uh, gentleness. All he will know is the God of force. All he will use is force. Anything he demands, anything he wants, it will be by force. Are you like that? If you are like that, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. If everything you want in your life, everything you want to accomplish, it's all by force. It's by do, do or die. Give it to me or I take your life. Give it to me or I make you feel miserable. If you are like that, you're serving the God of force. And it's like the Antichrist. And the Lord is saying, the Lord is revealing all these things so that the day will not come upon us unawares. So that you will turn. So that you will change. And you will not allow the spirit of the Antichrist to have the overpowering influence, overwhelming influence upon your life. It says in verse 39, Thus shall he do in the most stronghold with a strange God 
whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. By the way, as you read about all this, you are wondering, why will God allow this uh, for the children of Israel? Why did it come upon them? Let's come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. When the children of Israel were driven to the land of Babylon, and they suffered in the Babylonian captivity, that Babylonian captivity, the suffering, was to soften their heart, was to make them return unto God, was to make them repent. But instead of repenting, can you imagine that a nation suffering for 70 years in the captivity of Babylon and yet the suffering, the oppression, the persecution and all the pain of those 70 years in Babylon never changed them. You know, we were, we, we were seeing that if oppression comes upon any group of people, persecution comes upon any group of people, if suffering comes upon any group of people, you will think that the suffering will soften their heart, that the suffering will change them, that the suffering will turn them around, that the suffering will make them to say, oh, that's enough, oh God, that's enough, we'll repent, we'll turn away from our sin. Look at it in chapter 8, verse 23. Chapter 8, verse 23. It's telling us now in verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, when the transgressors are come to the full, as God expected that the persecution will change them, the suffering will change them, and all the untold pain will change them for 70 years, and yet they didn't change, they didn't repent, because of that God said, all right, when the transgressors are come to the full, and the transgressors just keep on transgressing. He said, because of that, in that verse 23, then he says, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And that is what you find, not only for the children of Israel at that time, in Second Chronicles chapter 28. Second Chronicles chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 22. Second Chronicles chapter 28. Verse 22, and in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that king Ahaz. In the time of his distress, in the time of his suffering, in the time of his pain, you will think that the pain will make the man to say, oh God, that's enough, I'm sorry. I've done evil, I'll do that no more. This suffering is too much, this pain is too much, and this distress is too much. Now I repent. That's what the Lord expected. But it didn't happen that way. Even though the pain was there, the persecution was there, the suffering was there, the pressure was there, the distress was there. The Bible says there, in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord. You know, sometimes uh, like that, when you, uh, somebody has been disciplined because of adultery or fornication, immorality, and sometimes uh, announcement is made, and you'll think because of that shame, public shame, because he committed that terrible sin. And everybody says, how could he do that? How could he do that? And then he's placed on discipline in the midst of that discipline. In the midst of that rejection, in the midst of that suffering, it still continues in that evil scene. Just like that man we are read about in the time of his distress, yet he sinned the more against the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 5, when the transgressors are come to the full, that's when the king of fierce countenance will rise up. If the Lord has brought some pain, some suffering, some, uh, some pressure upon you because you have sinned, privately, even though no man knows it, you should go on your knees and say, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. I know this is coming upon me because of my evil doing, because of my unfaithfulness and inconsistency, because you can see, you see everything I've done in the dark and that's why this pressure and pain is coming upon my life. Repent so that you'll not perish with the people that even after suffering then the transgressors still go on until they come to the full. Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Jeremiah chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 3. O Lord and not thine eyes upon the truth that was tricking them but they have not grieved. That was tricking them. 
You have punished them. You have chastised them. You have disciplined them. And yet, it says, they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they refuse to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than their rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, I say, surely these are, these are poor. They are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. The Lord is calling us to reasoning. He's saying, reason. Think about it. And know that this is coming upon you because of your sin. And then turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Don't, don't just say, okay, whatever happens, I'll be it. You know, if you're not careful, if you continue like that and become adamant and rigid in seen hell fire will be the final place of a boat for the one that has been often reproved and yet will not take correction as stephen says neg we're looking at me at uh, revelation chapter 16 revelation chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 9 Revelation chapter 16 verse 9 and man was scorched with great heat and he blasphemed the name of god which has power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. Punishment came. Suffering came. Chastisement came. And it says, they were scorched with great heat. And yet in the midst of the suffering, they were blaspheming God. In verse 10, it says, And the fifth angel poured out his veil upon the siege of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and did not their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. All that suffering did not bring them to repentance, but they just continued in their evil. I pray for you, for me, for us, it will be different in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now, which is the deceptive policy of the Antichrist. The deceptive policy of the Antichrist. When that Antichrist comes eventually, he'll use deception, he'll use a deceit, he'll use a craft. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. And through his policy also shall he cause craft, deception, to prosper. In his son, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. Have you ever had something like that before? By peace shall he destroy many. When the Antichrist comes, it's not going to be. Sometimes uh, he'll hide his fierceness. He'll hide his tyranny. His he'll hide his wickedness. And then he, he looks smooth on the outside and pleasant on the outside and peaceful on the outside. So as to catch the people, he'll talk nice, he'll talk kind. And then when he talks like that, people will say, this is the kind of leader we need. This one cannot hurt anybody. He'll just be very pleasant to everybody. But that's his deception. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall he destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Eventually, he'll be destroyed. I said he'll be destroyed. Uh, but you know, uh, here is where we need you, where we need to really have real, real wisdom. Real wisdom. In our lives, even though the Antichrist has not really come now, but he's still coming. But already we have read in the Bible that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. You know, sometimes maybe you're a lady and you, are not, you have not married yet and somebody comes with the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of deception. And he talks smooth and they talk kind and they look very nice and they look very caring. And then they're not even born again, but they may be in church and they're hiding somewhere in the church there. And they say, yes, I'm, I'm brother so and so. And then the Lord is sending me to you. Would you, can I have your hand in my, this is just the will of God. I'm not forcing anything. This is just the will of God. And the way the fellow talks, so smooth and so nice and so pleasant and so peaceful. You say, what else am I looking? for? Why do I need to pray? Why do I have to pray for donkey years? I pray years, years, years when this nice person is asking for my hand and eventually you get to, when you get home, then you see the Antichrist in his true column. The way the Antichrist behaves and the way the Antichrist lives and the way the Antichrist deceives people and the way some men, even some women too they look nice and they look gentle and they look so inviting and just until they get their will that's why the Lord is saying, 
be a man of understanding and be a woman of understanding so that the crutch and the deception and the flattery of the antichrist will not catch you. You will escape his hand in Jesus' name. It's a, I'm going to read it to you again, chapter 8 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. And through his policy, shall he cause craft to prosper in the sand. Craft, deception. You know, sometimes you want to do business and you have collected all this, your capital, and then you, you're looking for a partner in business. And this fellow comes and he says, well, I have this qualification. The way he talks is so convincing. And then you bring all your money, and then he says, uh, we're going to, when, when the profit comes, we'll do it like this, we'll do it like this. Do we need to write any paper of agreement and sign it and allow a lawyer to help us or draft any? Why are we, dra- are we, not, are we not children of God? The way I talk to you, can I cheat you? If you want, we can even, you can open the bank account and open it in your name. Then you are convinced that this man, so gentle, cannot hurt anybody. And then you put all your capital there. The spirit of the Antichrist has deceived you. And eventually everything is gone. That's why the Lord is saying, have the Holy Ghost within you that will make you to discern, that will make you to be able to see this is not for real. This is just deception. And I pray that the Lord will show you that and then you'll take heed in your life in Jesus' name. Verse 25, and through his policy also, he shall cut craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. He'll even be opposing the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The prince of princes are Savior and Lord, but then the Bible says both it shall be broken it shall be destroyed that without hands in jesus name we're looking at chapter 11 chapter 11 verse 21 chapter 11 of daniel verse 21 11 21 it says and in his estate shall he stand up shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give honor of the kingdom but he shall come in Peaceably. They will not give him any honor. They will not give him the control of the kingdom, but he will come in peaceably. You will think this one will not hurt anybody. This one cannot do evil. This one, I can, if I were not a Christian, I can cheat this one. This one is dull. This one is dead. This one is kind of, you know, you can override this person. That's what you think. When he comes out in his true color, you are gone. I pray God will deliver you. I said God will deliver you. It says so far, he, he come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He'll flatter you to death. And then it's when you are dead, you will know that something has really happened. Look at verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall walk deceitfully. The Antichrist, when he comes, he'll walk deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Verse 24, he shall enter peaceably even upon the fat places of the province. He shall do that which his fathers have not done. That what other people have not been able to do, the pressure, the oppression, the persecution, the pain that it will cause people, it will just come in peacefully and then he will be able to do his evil. No, his father's fathers, he shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, he shall forecast, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Verse 27, and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table. They'll speak, they'll sit on the same table like this. And you see the face of, you know, that man, the Antichrist. And everything will look innocent and everything will look peaceful. Everything will look like, you know, whatever you want. I'm just here to help you. I'm just here to take care of you. I'm just here to defend your rights and defend whatever belongs to you. That's what they say. And it says, they shall speak lies at one table. In that verse 27, but it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Look at chapter, chapter 11, verse 32. The first part of verse 32. But, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by what? 
by flatteries, by flatteries. When you find people that just flatter you and flatter you and flatter, even where you know that maybe you know that you are weak in this area, you are weak in this area, they never talk about that. They just flatter you and flatter you and flatter you. So something is going wrong. They want to kill and destroy you. That's why the flattery is there. And it says the people that do wickedly, it shall corrupt them by flatteries. That's the method. And that's the policy of the Antichrist. And the people that have that nature and that spirit of the Antichrist, that's how they will behave. Look at Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 25. Proverbs 26, verse 25. When he speaketh fear, when he speaketh peaceably, when he speaketh nice, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Seven abominations in his heart. And yet, he's speaking peacefully, speaking flattery. That's the Antichrist. I pray God will deliver us in Jesus' name. Let us come now, let us come back to Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. Will the Antichrist prosper forever? No, he'll be destroyed. I said he'll be destroyed. Let's look at Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8 verse 25 and through his policy also shall he cause crash to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his hand. By peace shall he destroy many, and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Tell me the rest of that verse. But he shall be broken, he shall be destroyed without hands. Daniel chapter 11 verse 45. Daniel 11 verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet... It shall come to its end. It shall come to its end. And none shall help him. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 7 and verse 8. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 7 verse 8. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That Antichrist, the Lord will consume him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Then all this that we are studying is for the latter days, for the end of time, when that Antichrist will show up. But even now, in First John chapter, in First John chapter two, First John chapter two, the Lord is calling us to wisdom, and that's why the Lord is revealing all these things unto us. He said, "Yes, the abomination spoken of by Daniel, it is coming, and it will be for the time of the end." But now we need to take it to ourselves because even that spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. We're told in First. John chapter, chapter 2 verse 18. Chapter 2 verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. Little children, it is the last time. And as she have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now at their, what? Many Antichrists. Whereby we know it is the last time. If there are many Antichrists, then uh, number one, you check up in your own heart. Do I have the traits of the Antichrist? Do I have the spirit of the Antichrist? Do I operate like the Antichrist? Am I deceptive? Do I want to destroy people and yet I flatter them? I come peaceably and I had the wickedness in my heart and appear as if nothing is happening. As if I'm a friend when I'm an enemy. Do I act like that? Ask yourself. If the Bible says now are there many Antichrists, you also need to check up the people that flock around you, the people that approach you, the people that come, come to touch your life, and they say, can we do this together? Can we get married? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we join business together? Are there some antichrists that are approaching you? And they talk nice, and they talk well, and yet in their heart it still destroy you. That's why you need to be vigilant and to say, oh Lord, I don't want to get into the hand of any antichrist. I don't want the spirit of the age and the spirit of the antichrist to have anything to do with me. Oh Lord, deliver me, and the Lord will deliver you in Jesus name. We're looking at 1st John chapter 4. 1st John chapter 4. I'm reading verse 3. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is not of God. 
this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is age in the world. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is age in the world. I pray that God will make you to watch. And to pray so that that day will not come upon you unprepared, unawares. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has revealed quite a lot to us today. As we have studied about this prophecy of Daniel. Pray that the Lord who has taught us and led us into the truth will grant you understanding. And that your heart will not reject or resist the word of God. But your heart we become very serious with the word of God. Be like Daniel. Be like Daniel. He meditated on the word. He meditated on the word. And it was the meditation of the word that made God to send the angel to him. To grant him understanding. As you rise up and as you are praying, you are telling the Lord, O oh Lord, I want to have understanding. I want to have understanding. I want to have understanding. It's those who don't have understanding that will be destroyed, that will perish. It's those who do not have understanding that will just uh, destroy themselves because uh, they don't have understanding. Tell the Lord, help me to meditate on the word, to count the word serious. Not just to come as the people come and to listen as the people listen and not to count it very serious because the last days are upon us already. The last days are upon us already. And the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. Pray that the Lord will not allow you to be caught, to be captured by the spirit of the Antichrist. A proper understanding will lead you to repentance. A proper understanding will lead you to salvation. A proper understanding will lead you to restoration. A proper understanding of the word of God will lead you to examine yourself. And say, oh Lord, oh Lord, I'm praying that that evil day will not come upon me unawares, unprepared. Tell the Lord, examine your life, examine your life. Where do you stand? What effect, what impact is this study having upon your heart? Are you like Daniel? That this word makes you thoughtful? This word makes you to meditate. This word makes you to apply to the mercy of God. Saying, oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. And when Daniel sought for the interpretation, God sent an angel. And when it's the Holy Ghost that gives us understanding, enlightenment, illumination, knowledge today. No more angels, but the Holy Ghost. But if we're grieving the Holy Ghost... By bitterness, by wrath, by anger, by wickedness, by cruelty, by lying, by unkind words. If, we're not, if we do not allow the Holy Ghost to be resident within us, how will He give us the enlightenment, the illumination, the understanding, the application, the interpretation of the word? Be sure you are saved. Be sure you are born again. Be sure your sins are all forgiven. Be sure you are living a victorious life. Victory over sin. Be sure you are living in holiness and righteousness. Every moment of the day. All the days of your life. Sanctification. Holiness. Purity of heart. The Holy Spirit finds it easy to operate. Easy to enlighten. Easy to illuminate. Whereas holiness and purity is the Holy Spirit. It will not stay, it will not dwell in an unclean heart, unclean environment, impure environment. The Holy Spirit lives, abides, resides in a holy heart, sanctified heart, pure heart. His resident teacher, his resident comforter, his resident guide. Is the one that sheds light on the world for you. Gives you understanding. What a wonderful experience to be saved. What a wonderful experience to be sanctified. What a wonderful experience to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Indwelt by the Holy Ghost. Saturated by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost being resident within us. Is the one that leads us into all truth. Guides us into all truth. 
and he reveals the might of God unto us. Then will you have understanding like Daniel? You'll have understanding like Daniel. You will know the times in which we are living. You know that these are dangerous times, delicate times. You know that the spirit of the Antichrist is the world. You're not just here say, yes, I agree to every man, every woman that comes your way. The Holy Spirit will tell you when to say no. Holy Spirit will tell you when to reject and say no, that cannot be. I cannot give my hand to that. I cannot be party to that. If the Holy Ghost does not enlighten you, every flatterer will get your heart. Every peace-looking person will get your attention. But when the Holy Ghost guides you, teaches you, enlightens you, illuminates you, it will make you to know that flatterer is not of God. That one that comes peaceably is not of God. That gentle, gentle lamb or two horns, one horn higher than the other, it's not of God. That crafty one, it's not of God. Then you will not lose all your capital in a business deal with somebody having the spirit of the Antichrist. And you will not sell the local church to somebody that comes and I believe the same thing like you believe. I preach the same thing like you preach. And look so nice and so gentle. You will not hand over the church in a region, in a state, or in a nation. Into the hearts of somebody that looks sheepish, peaceful, nice, kind. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Invite him. Welcome him in. Let him be the resident guide, teacher, counselor. Saved, sanctified, baptized of the Holy Ghost. I don't fear the power of anyone. Our own Christ is mighty, mightier than them all. However tyrannical or wicked or cruel, anyone that has the spirit of the Antichrist may be, the Christ in us is greater than them all. Greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. If you are born again, you have Christ in you. Sanctified, Christ is prominent in you. Filled with the Holy Ghost, Christ is mightily powerful in you. And you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear what anyone or the spirit of the Antichrist may do. You might be afraid and say, if I say no, 